Now we're going to talk uh, about reading and the notion of the triangle model, trying to understand the process of getting visual input about words that's known as orthography and how we map that up into some kind of understanding about the meaning of, of what a word is. Um, and also uh, are able to pronounce it, drive the phonology representation of a word. And so when we're reading, we're, we can kind of actually directly map from the letters to some kind of pronunciation. But especially in English, you have a lot of uh, irregular words that are not pronounced uh, normally, um, according to any kind of regularity like yacht. Um, and so often that actually involves some contribution of knowing what the word is through this sort of longer semantic based pathway. And so there's a lot of interesting dynamics that emerge in the interactions between these pathways. Um, also, what we're going to look at at the start here is the effects of damage um, in different pathways and how that affects uh, how you read words. And that's called dyslexia. Um, but this is a different kind of dyslexia than uh, the normal developmental dyslexia that's much more pervasive. So the key point of this model is that, you know, our knowledge of uh, individual word is really distributed across all these different pathways. And in general, this idea that uh, words are really distributed uh, across our entire brain. This is very well supported by neuroimaging data showing that when we think about different words, we activate lots of different brain areas that encode different aspects of those words, like, you know, what we do with it. The action kind of component is in frontal cortex. Um, the kind of how it feels is in somatosensory cortex. What it looks like is in visual cortex, etc. And so these kind of Semantics really here are a stand in for really patterns of activity distributed quite further across the rest of the brain. So here's the characteristics of the dyslexia results that we're going to look at. So there's phonological dyslexia involves an inability to pronounce non words um, like nust, favorite non word. <laughs> that kind of makes sense in terms of this direct pathway. If you don't kind of have this ability to translate these letters into a sound, you probably can't pronounce non-words. Uh, and obviously non-words don't have an existing semantic representation, and therefore this pathway isn't very useful for non-words. So it makes sense that phonological dyslexia would involve some sort of damage to this direct pathway. So deep dyslexia is characterized by the same pa a pattern of uh, inability to pronounce non-words, plus uh, these really interesting semantic errors, like people will be reading text and they see the word dog and they say the word cat. Um, and But they also make visual errors, so reading the word dog and saying the word dot, so some sort of mix up on the letters specifically. And that may be more characteristic of uh, developmental dyslexia, this kind of mixing up of letters. Um, but anyway, this seems to suggest that there may be some damage in the semantic pathway but on the other hand, uh, what we're going to see in the model is that you can actually explain this deep dyslexia strictly in terms of more complete damage to this pathway so that you're relying on the semantic pathway. And by so doing, you may not always kind of be tied to the surface version of the word that you read uh, and can make sort of synonym type of output errors like reading the word symphony and pronouncing it as orchestra. In the case of surface dyslexia, where things like yacht, this, this real strong exception word, is not pronounced correctly, um, plus you also get visual errors, and you have a kind of obvious inability to access semantic knowledge. So if I ask you what is a yacht, you don't know what it is. Uh, even more simple things, what's a hammer, etc. cetera. Um, this ability to provide sort of semantic meaning to these words indicates some kind of damage to this pathway. So these are the three different uh, phenomena that we're going to be looking at in the context of our model. Here's our model. It looks like a nice triangle. We've got orthography, uh, hidden layers connecting to phonology directly, and then indirectly through semantics. And uh, this network is trained in a very interesting way where we uh, present a uh, input pattern on one of the three different layers. And then we train in the plus phase 
uh, the other two missing layers. So you can see here, if I click on Act M, uh, we presented the word here in the input, and then we had the network kind of come up with its own guess for the semantics and phonology for that word. And then in the plus phase, we did the usual kind of error-driven learning and told it, oh, well, this is actually pronounced this way, and here's what it means. Um, and this word was the word hint, as you can see down here, barely at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, the input is literally one, uh, what we call a one hot or localist encoding of each letter in the writing. There's four units active. All of the words have four letters active in them. Uh, this corpus comes from, uh, and the whole kind of concept of the model comes from uh, a Chalice and Plout, or Plout and Chalice paper, uh, where they developed this little kind of mini vocabulary of such words. The output phonology is a kind of repeated slot-based phonology. Um, uh, these are all monosyllabic, single-syllable words, and they always have the structure of consonant, vowel, consonant, CBC. The vowel is always present and is in the middle, and then you have some number of consonants, uh, like think um, has multiple consonants here before you get to the vowel. Um, hint like this just has a h, but you have nt, so you have two consonants at the end. And so uh, this allows you to have up to three consonants beforehand, a vowel, and then uh, three kind of sounds afterwards. We train it up actually with e every which way. So we start with semantics and map to orthography and phonology. We start with phonology and map to orthography and semantics. So it's kind of fun in this model because we have uh, bi-directional connectivity every way. Uh, we can actually do that, uh, and, and that's a very powerful feature of having full bi-directional connectivity. So we train the model. You can kind of see it getting these different input patterns, different minus phases. You can see it popping up in yellow there, and just open up the trained weights. Okay, so now we're going to test the item, and now we're going to go back and look through the history. This is the word tart, and you can see the pattern of activity unfolding from this these letters, and it goes first directly into phonology through this direct pathway, and that timing is critical. So the direct pathway is more direct. It therefore gets there first. And then sometimes what you'll see is this very interesting phenomenon whereby this subsequent later activity coming through the semantic pathway actually alters and, and shapes our pronunciation here on the relative to what first happened through the direct pathway. And that turns out to be a critical feature of this model that in fact, even in pronouncing you know, regular words here, you get some contribution from the semantic pathway. And that's very important for understanding why damaging either one of these pathways can reveal essentially this codependency, this, this collaboration that was existing in the way that the model was pronouncing words in the first place. Plotting the errors for each of the different words in the corpus. And because it's a trained network, everything is doing well. So nothing much to see here. Okay, we're gonna lesion the network. You can choose which pathway to lesion. Uh, we can go ahead and lesion the direct pathway and give it a full lesion. And now when we test individual items, you can see that the activity has to go all the way around through the full uh, semantic layer pathway. And so it's reading strictly on the basis of this semantic loop. It doesn't have access to this direct pathway information. And this is what gives rise to the inability to pronounce non-words. If you don't have any semantic activity for a given input word, um, you're not going to be able to pronounce it. Um, this is not literally uh, simulated in this model. We don't have non-words, actually. Um, but you could make up new non-words and show that it doesn't pronounce them correctly. Um, and then uh, the other more interesting case is when the network comes up with a output pronunciation that is a different semantically related word. And if we go through and test all the words, you can see that because the system had been relying on that direct 
orthographic information, the actual letters in the word to pronounce things correctly, when that is now missing, it is now free to kind of make these kind of semantic related errors for saying the word cat when it sees the word dog, and that produces this kind of characteristic deep dyslexia profile. So we can look at this at the level of the individual items being plotted here, and you can see it's making a number of errors, and we can summarize those errors here and see that in several cases, this is now kind of being categorized automatically by the system. And you can see examples, quite a few here, of uh, semantic errors. So these are cases where the system has essentially output a word um, that is semantically related to the input word, but is not actually that word. And there's concrete words. Um, and then there's abstract words, so words that have a more concrete kind of visual semantics. The abstract words also suffer more from kind of these other errors, uh, uh, hard to categorize kind of random errors. And if we look here in our detailed plot about the semantics, we can see face, deer, grin, and we can go over here and look at our testing log and see that when deer is uh, obviously a deer and that got pronounced as hair on the output that's a, a bunny rabbit <laughs> um, and so a lot of semantic overlap between those two ones here's flan getting uh, output as tart it really does produce this kind of characteristic deep dyslexia effect even without having any damage to the semantic pathway whatsoever and this is emerging simply because of the existing codependency on uh, in the intact network of getting the orthographic information which is now no longer present and that uh, reveals the kind of laziness that the semantic layer had developed in kind of cleaning up its pronunciation uh, to focus on the actual exact word that was being presented we can also damage the semantic pathway and easily see, see the entire semantic pathway is damaged and when we look at the results of that, we see the characteristic pattern of visual errors um, and kind of other errors, but mostly visual errors. And so uh, basically that direct pathway was relying on some helpful cleanup from the semantic pathway. So sometimes it can confuses the different letters with each other, uh, but uh, otherwise it doesn't make nearly as many errors. This model helps us understand how the interactions between these different pathways supports normal pronunciation, normal reading, and that uh, damage kind of can, can reveal the interdependencies of these different pathways.